Welcome to AI Monday at the very famous Cyber Valley. Thanks for coming. Um, re really, really happy to have such a big audience here. Um, my name is Yuri. Uh, I do introductions in a few seconds. Um, just a few words, what's AI Monday? Um, AI Monday is an event series we started in 2017. Uh, when I say we, uh, it's the company Taiwal. Um, we're a Finnish-based company, and uh, we started AI Monday in Helsinki, of course. Um, we then moved to Berlin um, and had uh, this event series there as well. And uh, we always had such a big audience like here as well today. And so um, since, yeah, two years uh, on a five to six weeks basis, we um, join very exciting speakers to talk about AI, to talk about um, the technologies, the solutions, uh, the products they have been uh, built. Uh, maybe talk about ethics as well. Uh, we have um, topics around healthcare. We have AI. We have automotive. And, and so today we're here at the famous Cyber Valley, and I'm very, really, really grateful to to be at that great location here. Uh, and to being thanks for the Cyber Valley team. Um, let's get started. Who are the organizers, um, so it's one, of course, Cyber Valley team. Um, thanks uh, to the whole team around Anna and uh, everybody that ha helped us um, tell us setting up uh, all the technology here. And, and then, of course, um, the Daniel, who is um, joining uh, myself since, uh, I think, in May. We started here in the Stuttgart region. And it's the fifth, no, the fourth, the fourth AI Monday. Um, and then, of course, myself. Um, with that, I'm handing over to Valerie and Michael um, for a quick introduction into Cyber Valley. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot. Thanks to Tyval, excuse me, <clears throat> and Porsche for bringing AI Monday here to, um, I don't know, the home of Cyber Valley, if you will. So I'm uh, Michael Black. I'm the spokesperson for the Cyber Valley initiative that we've been building here since about uh, 2015 or so. You've probably read a lot about it. Um, so I'm very happy to welcome you here and to see so much interest in, in AI. Uh, Cyber Valley, uh, Valerie will give you a bit of an overview of what's been going on, and then afterwards there's time for questions uh, or over beer and pizza and so on. Um, but uh, there's a wave of, of different activities, and, and this is, you're part of a wave. Uh, our first wave was reaching out to the large partners that are part of the Cyber Valley Initiative and then building, uh, hiring out professors and independent group leaders. And now we're into sort of the, the next wave, which was always the, the main goal, which was to engage entrepreneurs, uh, startups, small to medium sized enterprises, uh, to really invigorate AI research and its transition out into the economy here in Baden-Württemberg and really to turn um, this region of Germany into a worldwide hotspot for AI research uh, technology development, innovation, startups. Uh, so I'll tell you a little bit more about what we've got planned, but uh, Valerie's got some slides to give you a little quick overview of, of Cyber Valley. Thank you. Okay, I'm really happy to see a full house tonight. Thank you all for coming. Um, Cyber Valley, Yuri said it's the famous Cyber Valley, but we've actually found that it's not that famous and that in fact even some people in the region of Tübingen and Stuttgart don't quite know what it is yet. Um, it started out as an idea um, in, in southern Germany because uh, Baden-Württemberg is one of Europe's most innovative regions. It's home to some of the most innovative companies, um, among them global market leaders like Bosch and, and Porsche, who's one of the organizers tonight. Um, it, they're also leading universities, five clusters of excellence, one university of excellence, and the MPI. And it's, a, it's always been a region where with strengths very much in the natural sciences and computer sciences. So it seemed like a logical progression um, to pool all of those strengths into a cluster for artificial intelligence research. And so when the letter of intent was first signed in 2016, it's, about, it's almost three years old actually, it was signed uh, the middle of December 2016, um, the minister president of Baden-Württemberg said he wanted to make um, southern Germany um, a, a sort of an ecosystem of excellence for AI research around the world and a place that would attract top scientists from everywhere. What's happened since then? Let's have a look. The idea originally 
was to establish uh, graduate programs, which we've done, um, also professorships and research groups, and to offer sort of the world's top young minds with uh, the best possible education um, in the field of artificial intelligence. Another goal, as Michael already explained, was to promote technology transfer and create a breeding ground for startups. And in the last three years, um, we've kind of experienced a major success story. We've gained a lot of momentum very quickly. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but just to give you one example of, of the success that we've experienced in the last three years, um, in July 2017, the International Max Planck Research School for Intelligent Systems was established. And since then, uh, we've received more than 2,000 applications from young people around the world. The original idea was to have 100 people complete their PhDs um, at one of the partner institutions over a six-year period, but we've already got in the first two years more than 100. And there's a third cohort starting um, in the spring, so there'll soon be probably about 160. And so we've done very, very well. And as you can see, it's kind of a timeline of major milestones. There's Bosch that announced it would con build a research center in Tübingen. Amazon's also building a research center. We recently established a public advisory board that, that addresses ethical concerns. And so there's been a lot of development in a very short period of time, and we've gained a lot of momentum. And in fact, CyberValley is already uh, among the world's leading research locations in the field of AI. Um, there was a statistic recently published in the Stuttgart Zeitung um, that sort of ranked uh, the world's leading institutions in the field based on the number of publications at top conferences. And as you can see, CyberValley is the top uh, European um, inst institution, if you will, the partner institutions. And in fact, accounts already for 55% of publications from Germany at top conferences, the two being NeurIPS and ICML in machine learning, compared with 45% for all other locations in Germany combined. And then we're working on a statistic for, to add computer vision to the mix, which then increases the ranking, I think, to number five or six, but we, need to, we still need to look at the, at the stats. So as you can see, uh, the region was already very strong, but the ecosystem has created momentum that's increased our strength even more. So this is kind of a blinding slide. You can see all of everything, all of the progression that's happened in the last couple of years. Um, I, as I already mentioned, there are clusters of excellence, professorships, research groups, all of which have started in the last couple of years. Um, and we've also done a lot of public outreach. Um, one of the reasons being that we think it's important to engage in, in public dialogue, also to sort of address the general public's concerns about AI. And um, events like this one are, 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 are sort of serve that purpose as well. And we mentioned briefly that technology transfer and startups are two of the main goals of Cyber Valley. And with the accession of the Fraunhofer Society just a couple of weeks ago as an associated partner, we feel that we've strengthened that pillar. In terms of startups and providing a breeding ground, Michael will now tell you about a new initiative that we've just started um, called the Cyber Valley Startup Network. And Michael will just say a couple of words about that. Thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Well, every <coughs> Whenever Valerie shows this, I, I feel exhausted and realize why I don't sleep very well. It's uh, a little overwhelming, uh, but when we started this whole thing, uh, we really thought that what Germany needs uh, is the opportunity to build new kinds of industries. Um, some of our industries we rely on are um, uh, facing all kinds of pressures. We want to make sure that Germany has an innovative um, ecosystem for generating new ideas and we thought AI is a place where we have strength. As Valerie pointed out, we're an international leader. Let's try to leverage this uh, to create new businesses. How do we create new businesses in this area? They tend to come uh, in a very disruptive way bottom up through startups. And so the very original ideas for Cyber Valley were about how do we foster startups in this region? The first steps of having a startup in this region is to have the people. And that's why we focus first on the education and, and uh, getting this graduate program in place so that we could get a feeder of, of great new minds coming through who some of them will go off into academia and other places, but some of them will hopefully start companies. Um, and so we've got a bunch of things going on related to uh, fostering startups. It's the, really the, the next big phase of Cyber Valley. And so tonight we'll, uh, I'd like to announce our new Cyber Valley Startup Network. Uh, this is a very lightweight process for startups to get involved in Cyber Valley. 
Uh, we have these, this is our current set of startups who, who are here, uh, Layer 7, Meshcapade, Predictive Queuing, Sagacity, uh, Scatterblogs, and Reasonal. Um, and uh, we're hoping there'll be another one by the end of the night um, and uh, more to come. <laughs> and if you have a startup and you want to get better connected to what's going on in the region, you want to be exposed to, well, I'll give you some of the things that go on. Um, you know, get exposed to this network. We're going to do more events like this. Um, uh, we've already done some brunches with uh, venture capitalists and so on. Um, we want to get you well known around the world and uh, get you involved with each other in some way. It's a pretty lightweight process, as I said. Uh, you need approval of the Cyber Valley Executive Board. This is reviewed every year to just make sure that our Cyber Valley startup partners are really uh, in the region. Uh, have a you, you don't have to be 100% in, in this region, but you need to have a foothold here. You need to somehow be related to Cyber Valley in one way or another, and um, I could tell you more about that, um, and uh, compatible with the overall goals of Cyber Valley, so <clears throat> largely in the area of intelligence systems broadly construed. So I'm happy afterwards to, to answer more questions, uh, answer questions about this, tell you more about the startup network, get your ideas about what you need and what would make this um, make it easier for you to start and uh, run businesses and um, be successful here. So that's what we're here for, really to uh, make you and this a success. So uh, with that, I'll get out of the way and get, get on with the program. Thanks. Before we get to the real exciting speakers, um, three uh, small slides uh, on Tyvel so you understand what we are, and then of course um, I will be around afterwards so you can have uh, we can have a conversation if you're interested to understand more. Um, as I said, Tyvel is a Finnish-based company. Uh, we started in 2017. Um, we are 12, 15 people by now, and we focus on everything disruptive. Um, we heard technology, disruptive technologies are rising up right now. Lots of companies trying to understand, okay, what does this new AI mean to my company? What should I do? Um, it, you know, it could be data, it could be IoT, it could be uh, anything that's, um, you know, sustainability that's changing um, uh, current uh, landscape. And the way we approach things are, we try to understand, okay, what's, what's behind this? What's, what does this technology, that disruptive trend, that technology mean in my specific context? What's the opportunities? What's the risks? And once we understood that, and once we educated the companies around those things, um, we're going to need to somehow do a plan, right? How, how do you reach the top of the mountain? You're going to have some kind of a map to walk. And so that's the disruptive place. And then, of course, you need to somehow need to you know, test it, prototype it, uh, and then put it into production. That's what we uh, call deliver. Um, and this is where we support our companies and clients to get there. Um, we do that in three areas, which we believe are the game changers, changes of the, right now. Um, one would be the whole topic around sustainability or circular economy, as we call it. We believe that you can actually change um, the, those problems with digital technology. Um, and Greta Thunberg is just one example of that trend just popping up and rising right now a lot. Um, then the second one is everything around data. Lots of companies are still you know, <coughs> making their decisions based on <laughs> on, on gut feel, right? Uh, and then uh, we're not, not even thinking about whether there is actually a business model behind the data that you actually maybe are capturing, right? So that's where we are. Uh, and then the second one is everything digital technology and AI, AI is just one of those that we're talking today about. And if you ask us, you know, you know, what, what is this guy now doing in terms of AI? These are just a few things that we're doing. As I said, we started with discover, discovery. So it's around education. It's around finding the use cases. It's around, uh, you know, looking into your processes and understand, okay, where can we actually do something? Um, and then it's around strategy development and alignment between business and IT, which is often a problem. And then, of course, getting into the transformation and the architecture 
uh, in order to set up some, te some technology behind it. That's all about it. Let's get started. And with that, I'm really, really happy to have Professor Huber as one of the first speakers. He's uh, coming from, and we're setting up this technology in, the, in parallel, um, from the University of Stuttgart and also the very famous um, Fraunhofer IPA, or is it IPA? IPA. IPA. Thanks for coming. Really, really happy to have you here. Thanks. All right. All right. So uh, it's nice to give a presentation in front of this um, huge crowd. So I'm giving a presentation on uh, explainable AI, um, introducing it um, to neural networks and how it can be applied to neural networks. Uh, I'm with the Fraunhofer IPA, IPA, if you like so. Um, I'm the head of two departments, one image and signal processing, the other one for cyber cognitive intelligence. And at the same time, I'm a professor at the University of Stuttgart. Um, just a second, okay. All right, uh, at Fraunhofer IPA, <coughs> I just read it, uh, Fraunhofer just recently joined um, the Cyber Valley. We had our uh, opening um, two weeks ago. And so there are two, let's say, central contract points at the Fraunhofer IPA for artificial intelligence. One is the Center for Cognitive Intelligence. It's relatively old, 15 months old. And uh, the AI, AI Innovation Center, which is our gift to the Cyber Valley, where we mainly do a technology transfer, so taking the results uh, the fundamental research results of the of the Cyber Valley and try to transfer them to the industry. This is our mission and this is our, let's say, role within the Cyber Valley. And therefore, we have different kind of, let's say, methodologies or tools, how we do this technology transfer. One is what we call quick checks. Um, this is a short-term uh, project where companies can provide their use case, apply for this quick check, and if they are funded, um, uh, this quick check is a try to be solved at the end. They get a feasibility study whether it can be solved with AI technologies or not. Currently, uh, the application process is up and running till Friday. So companies are still invited to provide their use case. Uh, and then in uh, January and February next year, we will um, execute these quick checks. Um, when it comes to AI, these two centers have different kind of focus areas. Uh, I will not go to any of these, would take uh, too much time. Uh, today I'm focusing on this part here, uh, where we try to get some transparency and explainability uh, to uh, machine learning models. Uh, so in this presentation uh, tonight, I will mainly focus on machine learning, particularly on uh, deep neural networks and how we can get some uh, transparency here. Uh, for the first, uh, what Maybe not everybody is uh, aware about this term explainable AI. So I give you some famous fails. Um, how, if you are not that careful, uh, learning a machine learning model can turn out to be, uh, to result in some bad results or even catastrophic results. In this one, uh, I would like to train a uh, machine learning model which is differentiating wolves from huskies. And here <clears throat> you see an example of one of these animals and maybe I can just ask the audience what do you think is this a wolf or is it a husky just shout it out loud yes you're good um, another example wolf or husky husky okay so uh, you are good uh, machine learning model uh, actually if you do this repeatedly you, it turns out um, it that you will end up with a nice with a nice machine model machine learning model you just do one error but this error is quite significant do you know why? You need to take a close, yes? Uh -huh. Okay, th this is about the metrics, but actually I would like to point to something different. Yeah, at the background, this is the right, um, the right interpretation of the, the, the area you're doing. So if you apply an explainable AI technology, in this case, it is Lime applied uh, to, this, uh, to this machine learning model. It turns out that uh, the model is considering everything 
but the animal. So it's actually focusing on the background and the problem here is that in most of the images you have wolf and snow and husky and no snow on the images. So actually what you learn to is a snow classifier and not a wolf or husky classifier. So this is a nice example, it seems to be funny, but it can become quite serious in other terms. So in this case, this is Compass. This is a, a system provided by a privately owned company in the US and Compass is still today used in, in, um, in, um, on, on charges about criminals. The com this Compass system is providing a risk prediction if uh, criminals get um, uh, recidivated. So the higher the number, the higher is the likelihood by the system uh, predicted uh, that the criminal get, uh, recidivates. In the first example, you can see that Prisha Borden gets a relatively high number. The maximum is 10, so she got an eight. But actually, it turns out that they never recidivated in, in, uh, in the past. Different to uh, Vernon Prada, who was predicted in a relatively low risk. Another example on, um, on the right, you see that uh, Dylan Fudges was uh, predicted a low risk, while Bernard uh, Parker was predicted a maximum risk of 10, but at the end, he never get criminal uh, again. So this could be, let's say, well-chosen examples just to somehow uh, tell bad stories about Compass, but it turned out there was an investigation that um, <clears throat> it, it, it really turned out that on principle, there's a strong bias against people with dark color. Um, so against blacks, Latinos, and so on and so forth. So they get um, su significantly more misclassified, get significantly a higher risk predicted, even though it turned out in, 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 the, in the data that this was particularly wrong. So in this case, if you are not careful enough, you, um, uh, you get a wrong judgment about people, and this is quite serious. So when we talk about explainability and transparency, it's all about to get some insights about machine learning models. And it, as you probably all know, currently the most used mo uh, models are deep neural networks, which are quite uh, opaque. They are often non-intuitive. This can turn out to be a problem depending on, on the application. So the use guy at the end might ask, why did you do a particular uh, uh, prediction? Why did you fail, for instance? If it fails, how can I do a bug fixing? This all becomes difficult if your machine learning model is quite intransparent. And explainable AI is a research topic which tries to get some transparency and some insights uh, here. There was just uh, last year a uh, publication by uh, the European Commission about trustworthy in AI and how we can enhance trust in AI technology. And uh, they uh, termed five very important topics that uh, modern AI systems need to satisfy in order to become uh, trustworthy. And one of them is, is explainability. So explainability is one, considered as one building block for uh, increasing the trust in modern AI systems. Uh, actually, getting transparency and explainability into machine learning models is not, not new. The, the phrase explainable AI is relatively novel, but if you phrase it differently as an interpretable machine learning problem, you can see here on this chart that there was active research already in the 80s and 90s. But you can also see that the curve of the papers on Google Scholar is significantly easy. Actually, it's an exponential growth. And this is not the cumulative um, score about the number of papers. This is just the per year number of papers in this topic. So there's a significant increase in research interest, but also there's a significant increase in public in this topic. So uh, here I brought you some headlines of just re some recent um, articles. One of them uh, might be quite specific, uh, but others also get very, very public, like on the Zeit or the here, uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung. <clears throat> and this is uh, the ethics guideline I just mentioned before uh, by the European Commission. So if you have a closer look to um, um, often used machine learning models, here I brought you some of them, and you put it on a, a chart where the x-axis is explainability and the y-axis is the prediction accuracy, you get qualitatively spoken, of course, to the following uh, categorization that, let's say, deep learning models typically you obtain the most highest prediction accuracy. And the more you go to, uh, let's say, to a lower prediction accuracy, typically these models become more explainable. So at the very end, you end up with decision trees 
um, which often have a very low prediction accuracy, but they are often explainable and transparent to the user because they can be tra uh, transferred into uh, if then rules. And these, if there are not too many rules, can be easily un understood by people. <clears throat> so these models, I call them white box models in co uh, contrast to the black boxes like deep neural networks. These white box models are explainable by nature. And the decision trees are not the only ones. Here's a typical example of a decision tree. There are also others like linear models. They are also considered as white boxes or uh, rule-based systems um, either transferred uh, or uh, uh, get, get out of a decision tree or directly learned are also considered as uh, a white box. Um, I'm often, often, um, often asked, uh, well, you're doing so much research on neural networks, for instance, why even you cannot explain why the model is um, providing certain predictions. And actually, what well, I often try uh, to, to get some insights why it's also difficult for me to make an, a judgment about this is there, that there are different levels of, let's say, uh, explainability or transparency. The most simple one is called simulatability. In this case, uh, you call a model simulatable if it's possible to make all the calculations manually in a reasonable time. And this is actually not feasible for a complex neural networks with the millions of, of parameters. You cannot do the calculations, whether maybe you end by the end of the universe or so, then you come to an end. But this is, of course, not reasonable. And same holds for random forests, which consists of hundreds of trees. You cannot make the calculations manually. Um, secondly, maybe a bit more uh, demanding is decomposability. Here, you not only ask that the model itself is explainable or simulatable, but also the data and the parameters are easily understood by the people. So if you would like to build a model that is decomposable, you're not allowed to make extensive feature, feature engineering because complicated features limit the explainability uh, capabilities of, of your model. And third, this is called then, maybe this is the ultimate goal. This is algorithmic transparency in this case, even the learning algorithm, so not only the model, but also the learning algorithm uh, can uh, easily be understood. This holds uh, for linear models because there you get some easy to understand uh, decision boundary, but this does not hold, for instance, for new neural networks. So these are some explanation why it's also difficult for, let's say, the expert to explain a, a deep neural network. Then, of course, you can ask yourself, well, do I really need this kind of explainability? And of course, there are some uncritical applications where you do not need this, this feature. Like in a mu music recommendation or mu movie recommendation, well, maybe you do not care much why you get this certain uh, recommendation. Or if you use a machine translation tool like DeepL or something else, if it's good enough, you don't care about the machine learning model in the background. But of course, there are some uh, applications where it is really critical like certain uh, application domains like production, um, autonomous uh, driving, medicine, these are all considered critical domains. Here there's uh, some demand on, on explainability. If there's discrimination or bias, like in the compass example, or even if there are some limitations on the law. And for the latter case, I provide you some um, example. Consider the GDPR, so the data production, uh, uh, protection, uh, regulation by the European Union. This becomes relevant, for instance, in the finance sector. If you apply for a credit, then you're typically scored. So in the background, there's some company like the Shufa, which is providing a credit score on you. And if you apply for this credit and this is rejected, of course, you will ask yourself, why have I been rejected? And these companies, because they have to apply to the GDPR, have to provide an explanation to you. And this is given by these articles here from the GD for, or here in uh, DSGVO, this is the German counterpart of it. Like in uh, Article 13, it says um, that the companies need to provide meaningful information about the logic involved if there's automated decision making in the background. And Article 12 tells you that this information needs to be provided in a concise, transparent, intelligible fashion. So in this industry, like in the finance sector, Today, they are only using uh, simple white box models. Typically, it's a logistic regression, scorecards, they, they term them. They are explainable by nature, as we now know. 
but of course they are limited in the, the accuracy. And these companies know if they would use a more complicated models like a random forest, they get a higher prediction accuracy, a higher, let's say, validity of, of their scoring, but they can no longer explain it. So the future, of course, will look differently. Um, for instance, we have a project together with one of these scoring companies to, to go in this direction, is that you combine black box AI, like a neural network or a random forest, together with some explanation matter to get both accuracy and transparency. <clears throat> so how, how can this be done? So we focus now on the following on deep, deep learning. As probably most of you know, the complexity and or the most information in a neural network is stored on its, on its weights. And it's quite complicated for us to get some insights about the decision making. I've just explained it to you, like the simulatability problem we have with neural networks. What we, for instance, are doing at Fraunhofer to get some uh, transparency is the following process. Of course, we still use the black box like a neural network, but at the same time, we learn what we call a surrogate model which is then used to provide explanations for the black box models. So we learn two models, the black box and the white box, and the white box is used to explain the black box. This is the basic idea behind it. And in the following, we need to fo uh, these two measures. The one is called the accuracy. Here we measure how well the white box explains the data and the fidelity, uh, which is the measure about how well the white box, of course, coincides with the black box. If you have a white box that is not coinciding with the black box, it's not worth to consider. <clears throat> you know this uh, surrogate also maybe from your from your, uh, private living. Um, if you have some, some birth marks, um, you often ask to regularly check them. Of course, you can go to the doctor and this guy is a black box to us. The doctor is a black box, a human black box. Let's call him. He can tell you some reasons why uh, your birthmark is difficult uh, or uh, com uh, can, can be in reason for, for cancer or not. But also there's a white box a surrogate to, our, to the doctor. These are called the A, B, C, D, E rules. So everybody can apply them and can understand them. So you check the asymmetry, the boundary, the color, uh, the, the diameter of the birthmark and also observe them over time. So you consider the evolution of the birth mic. And one, if one of these rules is um, um, hurt, you should go to the doctor. So this is the relation between a black box and a surrogate white box. <clears throat> so what we'd like to, to do is use a black box like a deep neural network, use as a surrogate a decision tree because this is an, a rule-based system at the very end. What we are aiming for is called model explainability. So we would like to explain the network as a whole, not single predictions. And currently we apply this, or we are able to do this for application, uh, classification tasks. This idea is not, not new actually. So there's a naive approach, which is working like the follows. First you train your neural networks on the data, and then you fit a decision tree directly on the data predicted by the neural network. This is a nice idea, it's quite easy, it's not complicated, but it turns out that the tree is relatively limited uh, in its representational power. It has low uh, fidelity, so it is not fitting well to the network, and it has low accuracy, so it's also not fitting well to the data. What we are doing in order to improve this is to, let's say, modify a bit the training of the neural network. And therefore you, we use um, or we modify the regularization of, of the training. So if you're a bit, um, let's say, aware how neural networks are trained, you, you know that you usually try to minimize a classification error. This of course we also do, but at the same time you add an additional term, which is called the regularization. In the classification loss, we minimize the error as, as explained in the regularization. Usually, this is also not new, Usually regularization is used to avoid overfitting. What we are doing is use regularization in order to make fitting of a surrogate model a bit better to the neural network. This is the basic idea we have. And how we do this? Uh, so we introduced a novel regularization term which we call the SO regularization, where S means sparsity. So we promote sparsity of the neural network. And at the same time, we also promote orthogonality of the weight vectors. And this in combination allows, or let's say, 
uh, forces the neural networks to take decision boundaries which can be more easily approximated by a decision tree. Sparseness means that many of the weight vectors are just eliminated. So it's your network gets thinner, let's say. And orthogonality, this is really the mathematical definition of orthogonal uh, vectors means that we would like to, tr to cover still a significant number of the features in the, in the input layer, but also in, in many of the hidden layers. And if you do this quite well, it turns out that uh, the neural networks uh, takes addition, decision, uh, decision boundaries which are close to be x parallel, which are also the same decision boundaries taken by, um, by the decision tree. I brought you some of the results on, on standard benchmark data sets. So the iris data, which is the hello world, let's say, of, of machine learning. Of course, we also started with this one. <clears throat> uh, here you can see the results on this. In order to read this plot correctly, so the x-axis, this is the complexity of the decision tree measured by the length, the depth of the decision tree, and the y-axis is uh, the AI, uh, AUC, so the classification error um, or the classification accuracy of, of the model. And let's say the steeper the curve, it means we are able to get a high accuracy with a less complex tree. And our approach is given by the green uh, curve. And you can already see we get a relatively high uh, accuracy with a relatively shallow decision tree, earlier, let's say, than any other me method. The black line, by the way, is a neural network trained without any regularization as a, let's say, a benchmark. And the lower, of course, then you can say iris data is relatively simple data set, so in the horse, la la la, you know this. And <clears throat> so, of course, then we apply this also to more complicated data with hundreds of thousands of data points, for instance, where you need more complicated neural networks to get an accurate prediction. So this is one, this is the Indian uh, diabetes data set. And here you can see the significant um, difference to other approaches so that we get a relatively high accuracy already with a very low, very shallow uh, decision tree. Of course, better than training the decision tree directly because our idea, of course, is to explain the neural networks and let's say sh more shallow trees with a high accuracy compared to many other approaches out there. And at the same time, it also turns out that the fidelity is, is, is high so that the decision tree expl is explaining well the neural networks so the fidelity numbers here are above typically 90% on, on the data sets. <clears throat> and for another data set, this is the mushroom. I can also show you how a typical decision tree then looks like. So if you take one, which is a, let's say of uh, a middle complexity, uh, you can see in the, on the right hand side, the corresponding decision tree. So this is really not complicated. Everybody can, uh, uh, follow the calculations or the predictions done by the decision tree. So this can be actually really used to explain uh, the prediction. I uh, can also show this live. So it, um, <clears throat> this is a small demonstrator we just recently uh, uh, created. What you can see here is a neural network, relatively sh shallow, trained on a typical production data set. Of course, we are from a production institute. We are interested uh, to see if this also works in production in environment. What you can see here is the features. Uh, we would like to discriminate uh, damages on a, on a metal plate. This could be a bump or a scratch. And uh, this is the neural network trained on, 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 on this data. And but what you just need to memorize is, let's say, how densely uh, connected this neural network is with, if you use no regularization at all. But at the same time, you get a relatively high accuracy of 95% on a separate test data set. If you, if you uh, incorporate our uh, regularization, you can already visually see the difference compared to the previous neural network. Already quite beginning in the training, you see that uh, the network gets relatively sparse, especially in the higher layers. Just a few weights survive but with a, let's say, a relatively high meaning. And once the training is done, should be done now, we just lose a bit of the accuracy. And from there, we could uh, fit a uh, decision tree. 
takes a moment. This is the corresponding decision tree. Also, this one is not really complicated, it just has a depth of three. And um, if you have never seen a decision tree before, it means at every node in the mid within the tree, you make a decision. So for instance, here at the root uh, node, this is the, the, min the minimum width um, of, of the damage. If this is lower than a certain threshold, you go to the left. If it's higher, you go, you go to the right. And this decision tree can be transferred as explained before into a decision rule, which is given here on the bottom. So it's easy to understand by a human what to consider in order to get a classification of a scratch. You can also from the decision tree directly get, let's say how important this rule is. For instance, uh, this one uh, calculates 87% of, of the data correctly and it's covering 47 of all the traders, uh, training samples. So it's really important. Almost half of the data is covered by this single node. And you got also some more relevant uh, explanation. This is also a gift, let's say, by the decision tree. You go to get the most relevant features. So in this case, uh, it's the X minimum and the thickness of the plate. And if you consider this large number of features, do you think you would have been able to, dis let's say, say, which are the most important features here? I'm not able to do so. Maybe most of you also not. So this is the, one of the key um, um, insights you get from the decision tree, which are really important features and also rules you can derive out of the decision tree. So now in the end of my presentation, what I explained to Nu is what is explainable AI. I hope uh, it was transparent to you how I uh, explained it. Um, and then our approach to extract explanation from neural networks by fitting a decision tree to a neural network in order to do this quite well, we modify the regularization in order to promote small decision trees. Currently we're working on also to apply this approach to different kind of architectures like recurrent neural networks or convolutional neural networks. And of course, also the way inflation is provided is quite important depending on the person that should receive the explanation. Like a machine learning expert needs a different kind of explanation than let's say the typical person um, who is just going to the doctor. That's it from my side. Thank you very much for your uh, attention and I'm feel, feel free to ask you questions. Thanks so much. Uh, in the interest of time, just maybe a one or two questions. <clears throat> I have a specific question. Maybe it's not in your research field, uh, but uh, I want to ask. In, uh, in the applying of AI in autonomous driving fields, uh, if you compare the you know approach of Google, Waymo, or Teslas, have you if you did this comparison or contrast, have you noticed something that they do right or better than other things? By this way, they reach you know better outputs. I mean, can you give some? To your view, some of your thoughts um, on autonomous in driving field? Just in, let's say, in, with respect to explainability or in general? In general, I mean, if you, I mean, if you just personally looked what they do there, uh -huh. let's say Tesla, what they did different than others, I mean, that's some okay. views is. Well, actually, I have no closure inside, let's say, like what, what the other car brands are doing, like Porsche or, or Daimler. But it's quite certain that uh, Waymo and uh, also Tesla were able to drive more miles than all the other companies. So they acquired more data than any other company. So it's quite expected that currently they are leading the field. If this stays in the future, I don't know, hopefully not, let's say for the sake of the German uh, brands. Uh, but the current situation is like this. Algorithmic wise, I don't know. I have not the, the insights, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, can you shed some light on how you conduct the AI use case quick check? Okay. How we conduct this? Well, uh, it's a relatively lightweight process. And so uh, we get from the company the uh, a standardized application form, which is describing the use case. 
first we just try to um, rate this one how uh, because usually we get more applications than open open spots once uh, the uh, the use case is selected we start with a very um, uh, with a with a small uh, kickoff where we uh, get um, a more a thorough understanding of the use case get the data of course uh, sometimes they don't have data then it becomes complicated um, to get an understanding of let's say the process in the background usually we focus on production problems so we need to get an understanding we also need to get let's say the contact persons the domain experts from their side also so they are still involved even though they have not to pay the quick checks they at least need to provide resources in persons so that we are able if we have if there are questions from our side that we can uh, quickly ask them and drop them uh, once this is done we start working um, in the midterm then we provide a um, a first presentation giving uh, let's say our our findings if we're going in the right direction usually this is the case and um, and then at the very end which is typically after 15 10 to 15 uh, working days they get a uh, result which is typically a, a small presentation about uh, the key findings the algorithm uh, algorithms applied so very often we are able to really provide a first implementation so it's not just on a slight level to get some judgment it is very often maybe 60 30 uh, 60 to 70 percent of the cases that a quick check also already ends up with a, a first prototype let's say all right now where's the mic Thanks so much. Um, so we, we have some time after the talks uh, with Spear and the pizza, and then we have some, uh, we call them speaker tables. So we're going to ask the speakers like Professor Huber to uh, be there. And then if you have any more questions, I know there was one, um, make sure you just have that conversation there. Thanks so much for coming. Okay, thanks. Really happy to have you here. All right, so why? So the next one is um, a company called Colugo and uh, Dr. Johannes um, Stelzer is joined, joined me on stage here. Thanks for coming. The whole team was here. We had some uh, chat before, so it was a super uh, exciting topic also. It's all around AI and art, which is, from my perspective, um, the kind of the end uh, when it comes to AI, when to bring, you know creating emotions is is something that's super hard. Super happy to have you here and excited to hear what you can talk about. Yeah, thank you so much for having me and thanks uh, to everybody for coming out here on a Monday evening. I'm quite amazed what a big crowd comes here at a Monday evening and I just simply cannot imagine how many of you would come if it were a Tuesday. So anyway, uh, I would like to share with you uh, two uh, tubing AI stories. What both have in common is that they are outside the typical sphere of basic research that you may be used to from this location. So let me start with the first one. Um, it's our company. It's about half a year old now at the moment. It's a free man show. Uh, Niklas Fricke, who's also joining me tonight this evening. Alexander, who's at the moment uh, scanning in the other building. He will come back later. And me. And um, before I continue, I would last like to formally ask Michael uh, if I could call this on that slot you were talking about before <laughs> with the Cyber Valley uh, startups. So uh, to fill it up for this evening. So what do we do as a company? We observe the following scenario. On the one hand, we have businesses, local business here. Some of the most uh, valuable, most powerful businesses, um, manufacturing, automotive, mid-tech, you name it, here, all around us in a radius of not even 100 kilometers. On the other side, we have top-notch AI research, as you see here in this building, in Cyber Valley. And somewhat, they are, they are, they're not connected. They're not connected. Yeah? And this is where our company comes in. 
The idea is to bridge AI research with business. And now you might ask yourself, what are were these guys also happy about uh, to have the AI train coming to them? And I would like to briefly explain you the reason for that. The way that businesses operate, as you know, is that they generate revenue by selling stuff, providing a service, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if a company uh, doesn't generate revenue, it dies, obviously. So the key idea is that once the AI train arrives, there's an extra bit of revenue that can be generated. And this is, in a nutshell, how consulting works. <laughs> so let me explain you how this uh, uh, magic miracle uh, works. Uh, this is more or less our bread and butter model that covers the vast majority of cases. So I would like to briefly introduce you to that. The core idea is good old supervised learning using powerful technology such as deep learning and other architectures that some of you may develop in the labs. And the core idea here is really you have uh, two data spaces, data space A, the input data space, and data space B, the output. And you learn this function, you try to approximate that function, for instance, by neural networks. So what is this all good for? In the research context, we're used to these kind of scenarios. As an input, you could train a model on low resolution, pixelated faces, and get high resolution faces out. Or we have some trouble in an image, like artifacts, and we try to clean it. Or we have a black and white image, and we have uh, a color image as the output. And really, if you have enough data and the right models, you can learn this function due to this transformation. And I, I personally find that quite stunning that it's possible to find such a function because with the traditional pedestrian way that you would use like feature engineering, you would not be able to do so. So how can this be applied in a business world? I prepared a couple examples for you, high level, uh, to give you some intuition here. First application field is uh, our manufacturing industry. And if we have as an input data, the process data, let's say motor currents, torques, voltages, temperatures, so on and so on and so on, time series of data. And as an output domain, we have the process outcome, for instance, the quality of some physical properties that are measured afterwards after that process. If we are able to approximate the function then we are able to teach machines how to feel. And that is of tremendous value. You could imagine that during the process, you measure what it will outcome, and then you can intervene, reducing costs or making a better product. So as an example, this could be uh, some factory who's uh, working with metal, who's working with metal surfaces. And they produce this kind of data and always measure afterwards what is the quality of the piece that they're working in. And then they refine and go back and forth and back and forth between refining and quality measuring. If you know what you're doing, if you feel what you're doing, you can shortcut this and generate more revenue. Another example from the automotive uh, field and with extension is uh, virtual sensors. Up there, we have data from a very cheap sensor low cost. Down there is our fancy expensive sensor. Given enough data from both domains, can we learn the function? That's always a question. <laughs> but uh, if we can, we don't need the expensive sensor anymore. We can directly use the low cost one and approximate the result of the good one. To give you an example, the low cost one could be a sensor measuring the rotations per minute in the motor. Yeah? Very cheap, you always have it, no matter. The expensive sensor could be a pressure sensor that is built within a cylinder that is all surrounded by furious explosions that happen all the time. So you can imagine that's an expensive sensor. That's a sensor that you don't want to put in every cylinder. And that's a sensor that also falls apart within a couple of months. It produces these fantastic pressure curves that are needed for you to decide how your motor is working. If you learn it from the RPM, you get it for free. The third example uh, is from a yet different field, the field of insurances. Uh, there are many applications also here. Uh, I picked one out for you. For instance, we could have photos of 
card images, and these insurance companies typically have millions and millions and millions of those. And at the same time, uh, workshop reports about the repair cost, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you learn the function again from the input space to the output space, you can, within a fraction of a second, tell how big the damage of your car will be, and that saves cost for the insurances. I should say insurances, it's a difficult field to work um, with, particularly because you have to be explainable, as we heard from the talk before. Okay, um, so far to the business side, as you remember in my, the beginning of my talk, I promised you two stories. So now I would like to uh, switch gears and come uh, to the other story. And that's uh, the story that Yuri was also talking about. It's about artificial intelligence in the context of art. Yeah. And as much as I would like to make a big announcement here, I unfortunately can't because uh, we are not there yet. We haven't found our legal entity. So for the German government, we don't exist. Um, but we'll probably have a, a, something like a Verein that's attached to our company. The idea is to bring together people who are interested in artificial intelligence and people who are interested in art and play with these technologies and create something extraordinary. So what you see here in the background is already one of the projects that we have been working on. Uh, it is basically a pimped version of neural style transfer that was discovered here in Tübingen from the Bitke lab. And uh, we combined that uh, with uh, several other techniques uh, using OpenGL and uh, a distortion fields like a computational liquid to create uh, to create a strange form that is always warping and creating different, uh, different, different images and trying to fool your perception. So this is the famous tubing data line. Another project that I really briefly want to introduce you is the use of uh, generative adversarial networks. Some of them maybe, uh, some of you maybe have already seen these kind of pictures. They are all fake. None of these people are real. Uh, you probably have guessed by now. Uh, they are generated by a, a deep neural network, by a generator. Um, and this is a very interesting technology yeah? because ultimately you can take any kind of data space and uh, explore it in a continuous fashion. For instance, you could train it on abstract shapes and generate forms. But what is even more interesting is to explore these in the sense of what kind of control do we have uh, navigating these spaces. Um, so the natural uh, way to go here is to take just a, a MIDI controller. And uh, here we have a gun. This gun is trained on cover art, yeah? CD covers. We trained it on a large amount of uh, CD cover arts, and then uh, it generates these cover arts, and using this uh, interface, uh, you can discover that space. So you turn the knob, and you're always creating a cover. It kind of looks plausibly like a cover. We haven't yet made the step where we connect this to music playback. That would be truly exciting if you can just tune in to that kind of music. I'd be curious what would, what would be the playback here. But it's a, it's a way to, to surf and navigate these spaces. If you're curious about that, uh, find me later uh, outside. Uh, we actually brought the little setup. You can turn these knobs yourself. Um, but yet, you could also say, why should a human do it? Couldn't an AI do this and optimize the image with respect to something? And the answer is yes. So which one of these is my true cousin? <laughs> 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 they're all fake. All of these young men are fake, and they're my fake cousins. I tried to propagate back my images. Our technology is not exactly there yet. Uh, it's not exactly me, but it's a very interesting way to, uh, to, to, to look at these images and to discover these spaces and also potentially use that for, for art piece later. Um, lastly, a little project that uh, combines uh, music and a bit of visualization. We got hands on a very large data set uh, of music data, playlist data, 
And we flew this through a deep neural network through an autoencoder architecture. And uh, what it achieves is it extracts the structure from this data. And with the structure, we created what we call music spaces, spaces of 500 songs, two days, one day of music uh, that you can listen to that follows the same idea. And we built that into an uh, Android player. And because we are not very good Android programmers, it always crashes. But nevertheless, the idea is um, that you have music spaces here that are discrete. And each of them have their own meaning. And this is a great way not only to organize your music, but also discover new music, because you can take two music spaces and listen to what is in between, or get suggestions for other music spaces that are interesting. So I hope I uh, uh, could tell you about these uh, two stories. Uh, uh, um, and um, I would like to thank you uh, for your attention and for the invitation. Any questions to Johannes? Hi, Fern Sachs, Mrs. Benz Consulting. Um, I have a bit of a hard time to understand your business model. Can you maybe elaborate it a bit? Is it about consulting? If it is about consulting, what's your approach? Is it about developing algorithms and selling them, for example, on the AWS algorithm cloud? Or is it a kind of art project? It's just to to get it straight, so what is the business proposition? In the, interest, in the interest of time, I massively shortened everything. So we are talking about the first part, which is the business part, which is our company, Colugo. The idea here is we go to local businesses, also businesses around. And we identify places or locations within that business where you can generate an added value using AI technology. There's a couple of prerequisites to that. We heard some of them already today, lots of data, for instance, and the right structured data. And uh, the idea is to generate added value within the company using this technology. We implement this. However, we are not the people who just implement uh, these approaches. I think it's important to see things in a bit of a larger context, because what ultimately this technology can give to you is it can open up new possibilities for new products that have not been possible without this. This is the most exciting part of all of this, but also more, most difficult to reach. But if you say this kind of technology, are you using all kinds of AI technology in all industries, or are you somehow specialized? We are specialized uh, to uh, a couple industries, namely mainly uh, manufacturing industry, insurances. This being said, uh, we very much adopted the approach of not walking around with a hammer and looking for the right problem. No, we go to companies and find the nail. Then we go into the vast literature of AI research and find the best hammers and tackle that problem with these hammers. When Johannes and I talked about um, the last one, I think, um, you know, recommender en engines like Spotify or Netflix um, are using similar approaches, but not that smart. So I think um, the technology is one the application of it and the use cases you could use that as the other one and uh, and I kind of the transformation transformation is uh, I think what what is the intelligence behind as well right um, so it's a valid point to to kind of question but I think uh, you know doing some research on those areas is um, uh, important and I, I'm glad you guys do that thank you so uh, if there is not more questions um, let's go to the next one thanks right. thank you. <laughs> Cool. So the next one is actually um, my partner in crime here um, from Porsche uh, and Simona. Yeah. 
Uh, so we are the partner in crime. <laughs> and that's a very good introduction. So um, Anya is written here, but unfortunately she's ill. So that's the reason why you get both of us. So I'm Simone Schulz. I'm responsible for the uh, digital enterprise in Porsche. And together with Anya, I'm leading uh, this initiative about AI at Porsche. And uh, Daniel is a member of Anya's team, uh, and we both are doing a lot of uh, stuff all together to bring forward AI at Porsche. So that's the initiative uh, we are driving. Um, so you hear that's, that's unfortunately not our project, but I think that's one of the great projects um, <coughs> Porsche is bringing forward. Um, we are using not AI at the moment in this space, but I, I guess uh, this will increase uh, a lot in the le electricity uh, environment where we are moving on and changing the whole activity. When we look at, uh, so I'm coming out of the IT environment, and in the IT environment we see a lot of change ongoing, uh, and especially if we look in the automotive um, area as well, we see as well a lot of extensive changes uh, where you need IT much more in the future. And if we look at our strategy, what we have in the IT, we have three pillars. Um, and you see there we have the Porsche Digital Experience, so look more at the customers and look what they are needed and how to bring this forward with the IT environment. The second one um, is, uh, of course, the artificial intelligence, and that's the reason why we are here as well and why we really bring this forward in all, all areas and all departments to move up there. And even if you use artificial intelligence, you need to assure as well the security piece. So the third part uh, is the digital security where we are driving our IT uh, organization through these three pillars uh, to move up as well the IT here and to bring up as well really speedy, nice uh, cars uh, all over the world. <coughs> we started at the beginning of this year an initiative, we called it AI at Porsche, and it's not only an initiative what we are driving out of the IT because of course, this is an area where we need up uh, and, and bring up the speed for the artificial intelligence. But this is as well um, an area where we wanted to increase in each and every department. So we defined a vision uh, that we wanted to bring for Porsche a responsible AI um, as an integral part of Porsche. So not only the IT is the one who is using the AI, but each and everybody should use in the end AI as a no normal um, written next to each other to really work um, in this area and bring as well better decision like we are doing at the moment and to, um, to make to assure that the regulations are there and to assure as well that the right approach will be taken. To, to assure that um, we move the mission as well, we, we try to strengthen the individuality and the quality of the Porsche area because it's not only that we wanted to be efficient and really make money as everybody is trying to make uh, out of their products, but as well to move up as well with new business. And we see there as well a lot of opportunities for us as well to increase our business and use AI all around uh, speed and all around uh, our product, what we are using at the moment. So we decided to look into the whole approach in each and every area and branches to see what use cases they have and where we can use uh, in the processes. On the one side, the automation increase. Uh, on, on the other side as well, how to increase the business overall and bring forward. So we looked and tried to cluster the use cases which we had on each and every area. So if you look in, in finance or in procurement or in after sales uh, or in the development area or in production, you see a lot of areas coming up in the AI environment. When we look at uh, these uh, use cases, we see that a lot of um, can be already fulfilled with some parts of the products which are already in the market because you see every day in the newspapers that some of the providers are bringing up AI pieces into their products and everything is already there. But with all the um, areas where we are now of, of um, internet or if we look at uh, uh, IoT, 
everybody is calling it already IoT or connected. And uh, when you look a little bit uh, in depth, you see uh, it's only a part of it. And I would guess at the moment uh, the same happens now with the new word. Uh, this is called artificial intelligence. And in each and every area, you need to look a little bit deeper what is really there and what is really AI. Is it only data or is it only a part of it? Um, but anyway, of that, we needed to look at what is on the market and figure out if it fits already our use case and fits already already our problem. So if we look at our use cases and figure out it, there is already something there in the market and we can use it, we just buy it and uh, bring it in and use it uh, in this environment. That's seldom the case, but in some area it is. Uh, so that's one reason why we move up with the use cases. The other part where we look into it is that we see, okay, we needed to develop something in this area, and we we have have done it before, um, and there we look for some partners or try to do it on our own or try to do it with a daughter of of our own to figure really out uh, is this in the end the product what we can use and perhaps sell as well for from an, an additional uh, area where we bring forward our business. Um, so that's the second part where we look at our use cases and try to figure out. And the third part where we look into it is um, that we try to look in each area, area, is there a generalized part which we can use and reuse um, because the problem is similar to something what the procurement department has or the finance department has or the production area has. Uh, and where we can make some patterns out of it and some platforms out of it and figure out if this can be used and reused as a standardized part to, to this problem, extend this problem environment, the solution environment has an AR, AI part, the data part, um, and it's an IT part. And for that, for that um, that's the third area where we cluster our use cases. If you look at our technology, we cluster the use cases in four parts. So that's the vision and auditation part. So there we look as well at the image and video envi environment for the recognition patterns around that. The second one is the speech. So looking at the human language there, the, the chatbot uh, uh, area, there's a lot of use cases in this area where, the, where we can extend uh, this environment and use as well uh, the text to speech or speech to text or, or all together. And the third one is the estimation and prediction. So the reason the prediction and use there a lot of data and try to use the data and figure out uh, how to get the data from one system out of to the other and uh, reuse it. And uh, that's one of our problem, I guess, not not only our problem, but all the others have the same. So I think there can be an extension anyway as well for the AI part. And the fourth one, uh, which is as well not an easy one, is the planning and optimization to to select and use information and really to make forward um, activities and predictive activities to move on. Sure. So do you hear me? Yeah, yep. sounds good. So now um, you saw our four pillars and um, I just want to show you a bit more in detail for one example what we are doing in our vision and uh, audition part. Um, this is a real case. I hope we have sound, I don't know. Uh, let's try it. Okay, that doesn't work. Well, one second. Does this sound good? <laughs> probably not really. Um, so <laughs> there you probably hear the, the problem. Um, if you buy a brand new car for probably more than a few thousand of euros uh, and you have something like that, it's not really good for our customers. So what are we doing usually? So usually here you see kind of a test bench uh, from our uh, R&D department where we test nearly every part of the car. For example, the mirror or the doors, the spoiler, everything. So we test it usually for three weeks, 24 seven. But as you know, uh, we have uh, workers, they are doing it manually. So we have a manually mo uh, monitoring and they only do it max 10 hours, five days a week. But as you know, problems can also come up on the weekend or during the night when there's no worker. So where do we want to go? So probably want to have a digital monitoring 24 seven um, based on an AI solution. But what does this mean? So we started, for example, with the 
um, mirror of a 911. And what we tried to do was to set the hardware product up, there you see the mirror. So, and then we uh, programmed our algorithm. So what is the algorithm? The algorithm, it, so we have a microphones that detect the sound of the mirror. And then we split it into the spectrograms as you can see here. And the algorithm detects if the sound is okay or not okay. So what we initially did was that the workers listened to the sounds and labeled them. It's a good sound or it's a bad sound. To go one step further, we did it really under laboratory, uh, laboratory conditions. So normal room temperature, like probably 20, 24 degrees uh, in a sound chamber. And we did the analytics part afterwards. So that was kind of the easy part but that is not that what, us, uh, what helped us really. So then we tried to test it under the real life conditions. And the real life conditions are as well the room temperature, but as well the heat and uh, the climate chamber. So we tested up to 60 degree and uh, down to minus 40 degree. Um, and as you can imagine, if the mirror goes all the way up and down, up and down, uh, you have a difference if you do it when you uh, have minus 40 or plus 60 degree. Um, and the fun part was the real-time analytics. So what we wanted to do is that we have, as you see here, you can see it on the next slide better, you have a laptop. Um, and the laptop shows you at the moment when the mirror goes up and down in real time, okay, this is a good sound or a bad sound. And then we save it, for example, if it is in the night, we save it and our um, worker gets the information in the morning that he has the possibility to listen to it afterwards and check, okay, it was really a bad sound or it wasn't a bad sound. So sorry for that, this, uh, that the words are in German, uh, missed that. Um, so what was the setup about? So basically we just did it firstly on a laptop uh, with the algorithm. We had our mirror out there. We had our uh, controller for the three week run and as well um, audio interface. We had diff different microphones we tested. Uh, in German, it's the Körperschall sensor uh, and the normal microphones. So we tried to figure out which are the best sensors um, to use to fix that problem. So anyway, when we did that, we probably needed about two or three months to find the perfect algorithm with the perfect sensors to get about 98 to 98.9% uh, accuracy of the algorithm. But the fun part was not to do it on the mirror because as I told you earlier, we have like spoilers, doors and all that stuff. What we try to achieve is that we use one algorithm and can put it in every different um, use case, for example, with the spoiler. And what we achieved was with that algorithm, we firstly developed with the mirror we can, could use it for 80%, for example, for the spoiler and the doors uh, and all the other parts. So we could reuse the algorithm and has just to tweak it on uh, one or two parts that make it um, like even better than before. So this is just one short example. We have a few more examples which I can show you later on um, when you come to our stand over there. And uh, thank you very much. And any questions? Um, when I see these pictures, I just remember this Apple uh, the MacBooks. Uh, they developed a new keyboard systems, and in lab conditions, everything was you know clear, clean. And then, you know, small particles uh, locked to all systems and it was a worldwide program problem. Even for Apple, I mean, they have this proficiency on their hardware, which is not complicated with, with like car cars. That's why I'm just asking, okay, lab test is okay. I mean, it's just one part of, are you also testing some cars, you know, maybe driven 100,000 kilometers, somehow maybe in Dubai, in deserts, you know, these customers or some so-called cold countries, I mean, not completely separating the car, but at least, you know, some functions to have this, you know, quality at the old time. So this is probably a, a very good question. The case behind this was not testing in Dubai or testing in Scandinavia, like the whole car, but important is, so if you look on a 
R&D part when, when you develop a car. For example, you test here the, the mirror and then you check it if it's okay or not. But then on the same time, on the outside, the cars are running in, in Dubai or I don't know, anywhere. Um, they're running all the time and they even don't know if we have tested everything here in Stuttgart, for example, the mirror already. But if you have something like that closely to real time, you can imagine to push it to them in Dubai in, on an app or whatever, uh, that the test drivers see if, okay, this was a mirror we already checked um, in, in Weissach or wherever, um, and it had a bad noise. So it's okay for me in the car that the mirror has a bad noise. But you can imagine as well to put it in the car if you test it in Dubai, but not so far at the moment. Or didn't I get the question? No, no, I probably I didn't get understand. I just mean buying or rebuying the second-hand cars, which is ah. used in different countries. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have real, you know, the, the yep. real roads. And then testing parallel to this, you know, lab development. I mean, not mm -hmm. as alternative, but as parallel, you know. Could be, uh, yes. But th this is just an idea, right? So your, the question is, so that I get it right, cars which are, have, I don't know, driven or in Dubai or whatever, it's a second-hand cars. Okay. And then they come back. And you buy it buy again, okay? And yeah. then test it, not separating whole cars. And then see, real, you know, the real station, because, I mean, not laboratory conditions. Yeah. At, and after so, but we usually don't buy cars back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's absolutely no problem. <laughs> So usually there are other people that want to buy the car. <laughs> we can check it later. No buyback. That's also a good one. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I would like to address the topic of transferring a proof of concept into industrial use. Because um, one disease, so to say, of AI projects is that we have many POCs, and then we need, when we face industrial rollout, several logistic problems approach. For example, there are different models of mirrors. They can re require retraining. There are different acoustic environments, maybe different uh, microphones and legal frameworks in different countries. Um, so if you may disclose or let us peek a bit into it, how does Porsche address this issue of transferring POC into industrial use? Thank you. So I cannot super go deep in, in that particular topic, um, sure. but uh, I, I can do it more generally. Um, so if you face a challenge like this one here, um, we are not the only brand or not the only company who has a problem um, with testing 24-7. Uh, so what you can imagine, and that's what Simone uh, told earlier, um, I think we have the hardware to test it. Um, and we have also good brains in our side, um, which we, they can develop the, the software part and the algorithm part. The hard thing is what you said is, okay, now we're from the test bench, super fine, but how can you industrialize it? So for example, in this case, you could imagine to build a product and a service around it for like at the first part, more closer to our industry um, companies where you can get, give a service and it's probably a whole package for microphones and uh, different conditions. Um, then it's super sharp. But I think the more challenging part for companies like us is not, for example, selling this to others. It's more bringing a POC um, into the real life world. Um, and then, yes, the DevOps model is completely different um, than buying, I don't know, an SAP HANA or whatever. That's difficult as well um, with SAP uh, HANA, but that's a different challenge. <laughs> but the DevOps, I'm sorry, I know you're from <laughs> SAP. <laughs> but the DevOps is completely different. And I, ha I think you have to set up the whole company on a different level for example, as a, we usually call it product teams, it's, it's nothing new, um, but the DevOps model has to be changed and the IT organization has to be changed that you can really use models like this, especially if you think about it, if you, if you use it, it's not only just using it, it's retraining um, and it's re-monitoring all the time of it. Um, so it's a huge 
organizational change you have to do. It's not only the technical part. One last question to Daniel. Great. We're getting closer to the beers. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks so much. So if you um, paid attention earlier when Michael was showing his startup um, slides, you might have catched one of the logos, which is um, Layer 7 AI. And so I'm happy to have them here on stage today. Thanks for coming, Peter. Sure, thanks. Can, can you hear me? Yeah. Ah. OK, so this is, the, this is the good spot that I got, I guess. I'm between you and B and pizza, so no pressure there. Um, I'll try to be quick. Um, as you might also hear my stomach rumoring, but let's see how it works out over the next 15 minutes. So uh, what I want to talk about, I want to talk about automating quality control with the help of AI. And before jumping into this use case, um, I would like to spend a few minutes or not, maybe two or three minutes on sharing some thoughts why we actually decided to start a company. Because I think Michael said it earlier, we're trying to kind of build an ecosystem here. And before we actually launched our company, we also asked ourselves what are kind of the key ingredients that you need to build an AI startup and maybe to build meaningful AI solutions. And we came up with, with at least three core skill sets that you need in order to build such a company. The first one is quite a no-brainer. It's deep expertise in AI. That's why we are in tubing. That's why we're in the Cyber Valley. That's why we're very closely connected with the scientific community. But the second part is at least as important is you need people who can productize. So what that means, we are in this great building. And I think there are a lot of very talented, very smart, very bright people. And their bread and butter, bread and butter business is to uh, develop machine machinery models, but they use that, but they use them in order to produce papers. So obviously, the prerequisites to such a model are quite different to the prerequisites that you might have when it goes to production. So you need UI, UX, front end, back end, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then lastly, you maybe also need a couple of people who can commercialize it. So you need some, at least a little bit of business know-how. And these were kind of our starting hypotheses, how we wanted to build our company. And we wanted these three expertise reflected in our founding team as well. And that's what we did. And looking at the deep expertise in AI, I think somebody said it earlier, the style transfer example was actually developed by the team around Matthias Bethke, who is the first face in the line here, who's a professor at the university. Uh, Alex Ecker was involved, who by now is a professor in the University of Göttingen. Uh, we have some software expertise with Beha, who is in the room somewhere as well. Oh, yeah, he's back there. I uh, used to work for Irene Watson. And then myself and some other colleagues. Uh, I, for example, have a background indeed in consulting. I used to work for the Boston Consulting Group. And we always had this hypothesis. These are the skill sets that we need in order to build meaningful AI solutions. So what do we do? Maybe a, a little kind of a more broader picture before I jump into the deep dive use case uh, quality control. In the end, we build customized AI solutions for, for clients. Our focus in the, indeed is Industry 4.0. So everything we've heard about, predictive, uh, predictive maintenance, reject rate reduction, uh, quality control, what we're going to talk about. But we also have touched upon some different cases before and after in the supply chain. So everything around planning, and I think we've heard that as well. If I know how much sales I'm going to generate the next three to six months, I can obviously optimize my supply chain, uh, my, my inventory management, my procurement, et cetera, PP. And the same is true when I go to the customer-facing functions, when I think about everything about personalization, um, when I know at what time I have to approach a potential customer through which channel, with which offer, I can maximize the probability that this potential lead actually becomes a client. But uh, having kind of given you the broader picture, what we wanted to talk about is automating quality control. So maybe to start off um, with a little bit of a kind of problem description. Why is it, why is it even a, a problem that we might want to tackle? Um, first of all, there are thousands and probably hundreds of thousands of people and workers who still do manual visual quality inspection. 
And this is a super exhaustive task. If I could imagine, or if I would imagine I sit there eight hours a day, after 20 minutes, I am not able to distinguish between a good and a bad part. It's just, maybe I'm also not tough enough for that, that's fine as well, but it's a very exhaustive task and it's, 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 it's quite, quite uh, difficult to do it for a long time. At the same time, you might have potentially long inspection times and even more important, the inspection results that we get from the different workers are oftentimes inconsistent because worker A says, well, this part is still okay, it's borderline okay, and worker B says, ah, for me, that, 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 doesn't, that doesn't cut it. So we don't really get consistent results. The next, the next point is it's kind of non-transparent, non-digital, because obviously it's a manual process, and you also, due to the task, you also have quite a lot of retraining uh, efforts uh, because you have quite a lot of churn in these positions. So overall, in the end, it's high labor cost, it's quite a lot of cost, it's exhaustive, it's a task where ideally we can use AI and deep learning in order to automate it. So how would an ideal work look like? So, I mean, from what we heard today, we, we heard that computer vision algorithms have done a lot of, have, have, have done a lot of, uh, uh, or have, have achieved a lot. And I mean, we know we have industry cameras, um, so this together should, should do the trick. No? Um, because in the end, we should be able to develop a model that doesn't tire. Um, it should actually be very quick in doing the inspection and giving us the inspection results. Uh, it should be very consistent because we can kind of tell them this is a good part, this is a bad part, and it should be by nature transparent as it's digital. And obviously, we can also kind of set up a hybrid system where the model learns from feedback. So I can still, hip, I can still have the human in the loop, give an additional feedback, and so the model keeps learning. And lastly, also obviously, we have lower labor costs. So when we kind of looked at the problem solution description here, we thought, okay, we want to build a product that kind of tries to address these challenges and, and comes as close as we can get to these solutions. So our product that we built is divided into two parts. The first one actually, and that's very important, is on-premise at the client side. So what is it? It's, it's in the end that we want to do the inference on the edge uh, so the model is actually being calculated on this little thing, which is an industry computer, uh, in our case, a uh, rugged dice, so a industry-ready um, TX2, so it's based on the Jetson platform from NVIDIA. Um, it has a little GPU in there, so we can actually, we have all the compute power we need uh, on-premise. We take some standard industry cameras, so we work together with kind of the standard providers, Bauma, Basler, Cognex, um, we are uh, camera agnostic in that sense, and you also get a little industry monitor where you can kind of on-prem see what the model is doing. But maybe not more importantly, but as importantly, the second part to it, that we say there's a web application where the workers can actually interact with the solution. So, and there are three features, and maybe the first two kind of coincide a little bit. Obviously, um, what we wanted to build in is that you yourself can label data good part, bad part, and you can also review the model. Because especially in the beginning, you might have a phase where the model is not as good as you want it to be, so you can get feedback saying, dear, dear model, the prediction you just gave is not the correct one, I think this is a bad part. And by doing this, you obviously, obviously create labels, which you, then can, which you can then again use as new input to retrain and recalibrate your model. And then lastly, something I think mostly for convenience, you get some automated reports, um, as, as this is a digital tool, you get everything around uh, how has the history been around reject rates and in the mid to long term, obviously you could also use this data to, to do something predictive, saying why is it the case that every Monday in the month we are better in quality, uh, we are worse or better in quality. Um, this is something that is not there yet, but obviously I think if you have the data, there's, it's easy to spin your head around that. So. I said earlier that we kind of wanted to build as a kind of hybrid system that you can give feedback and the process is really easy there. Um, in the end, we, we, we deploy our product at the client side, the uh, error classification happens through the model and you have the opportunity to do an image review, uh, the model, the, correct, uh, the prediction was not correct. We use that as feedback, as new labels for our model refinement and push on the model, improved model back on the installed hardware at the client. So, we are also in, and I think um, 
I think you, Michael, mentioned that earlier. We are also in Germany and we are in Baden-Württemberg, so, so companies are also quite conservative. Huh? And it's <laughs> a, part, a part, obviously, from the companies present, yes? Um, so we thought about this is a new technology. How can we actually push this into the market? And how can we show that we are pretty certain that this doesn't stay a proof of concept, but that this is something that can be used in the, uh, on the shop floor? So in the end, we said we want to have a five-step process where we take on the risk at the beginning and we only get paid if our model actually delivers. So the process is like this. First of all, it's classic. We need to understand what is the use case that you guys have. Um, and we need to agree on something. What, is the, what are the model key performance indicators that the model needs to achieve? So accuracy, latency requirements, et cetera, PP. And if we agree on a use case and agree on certain KPIs, then we say, okay, we install our hardware non-invasively. We then collect the data, label the data, and train a model on it. And then we have a very important step, which is step four. We have the model evaluation. And remember, we agreed on certain KPIs here beforehand. And if we do not, if we do not achieve to get these KPIs, so if we said we're going to get a model accuracy of, I don't know, 97%, and we come out of 94, we do not get paid which is not perfect for us, I'm not going to lie, but this is kind of the promise we make. But if we actually manage to get the KPIs, if we manage to get the model that has a positive business case for you guys or for the clients, then also we would like to get paid. <laughs> so in the end, it's the, the, the pitch is pretty, pretty easy. The first four steps are at our risk, but if we manage to deliver what we promised, then we also need to, get a comp we don't need to get compensated. And that's why it's a performance-based purchase in the end. Say again? For the model development? It depends. It, it, uh, uh, it, it, let me, okay. It's, it really depends. Um, we have gotten stuff to work in two weeks, but it can be a few months as, as well. But usually this is tied to kind of the uh, phase three because you need some time to actually get the data first. And um, that kind of correlates a lot. Yeah. Okay, so but now I think the, the one big question is, and what, what we always get asked is, yeah, cool, sounds good, but hasn't automatic visual quality control been an industry standard for years? And the answer in a way is yes, because when you look at the market, how we see it, there is, you can kind of divide it into three subsets. So the first the first subset is traditional visual, qu visual quality control, which is oftentimes rule-based, so you kind of define certain rule sets, um, and it works really well. It has been around for years, partially for decades, um, but it's mostly used for relatively, of, for the easier use cases at least, where you can actually do, where you can explain something in a rule-based fashion. So it's about measuring, counting, etc. And then, to no surprise, there are a lot of workers who do the 100% manual quality control. So for some reason, these systems, either they have not done a perfect job in sales, or these systems were not able to cover these use cases. So we do have the 100% manual visual quality control, and this is for use cases where the uh, variance in the error types is a lot, a, lot, a lot larger. So we talk about maybe surface texture inspections, et cetera. <laughs> And then lastly, we have use cases that apparently have not been able to optimize yet, but also not, uh, have not been covered by the 100% uh, manual visual control guys because of very high throughput. So if there's a high throughput and you, don't, you only get milliseconds to, con to kind of inspect something, not even a human, or maybe some special humans can do it, but most of us cannot really do it. So when we now look at the market, it's quite interesting there is some really, really great companies in the, um, in the traditional visual quality control space. I think uh, maybe I can say local champion, not sure if that's true, from MV Tech Halcon is one solution. Cognex is a really, really uh, big provider in, in solutions and there's a lot of small, medium-sized companies as well. But when we look at kind of this new space, there are obviously players in there and also all these players try to go into this market but no real market leader has emerged yet. And the question is, why is that? And the answer in the end is kind of, it lies within AI. I think we've heard today how difficult it is to scale something, 
because usually what is AI really good is, is really good at solving a very clearly defined problem in relatively, um, in, in, in a very really relatively slow, uh, small scope. So it's gonna be pretty tough to develop a model which is able to inspect this part and also the copper ball down here. So in the end, what do we need? We do need people with the right expertise who can fit and develop these models. So in the end, in order to have, to have the artificial, artificial intelligence work, we kind of um, have a shortage in human intelligence. No? That's why it's great that we have kind of the impress and, and, and research, research site, and we now have a machine learning master in tubing, um, but I think we're not really there yet, and we cannot be there yet. Um, just to give you one example, um, I think Element AI may be a company that a lot of you have heard of, is uh, one of the best funded companies in Canada. Uh, we and I had the chance to visit them, I think this spring. So they, 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 a lot of expertise, great people, but they say they did an estimate around the world, there are around 10,000 real AI experts. What does that mean? You have to ask them. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot up for debate, but that for us is the reason, because you need this expertise, you need this human expertise to make the artificial intelligence work, that's exactly the reason why we are located here in the Cyber Valley. That's why we are super happy that we are co-located with, with the university, why we collaborate with Max Planck with the university. And I think this kind of nicely sums up where I started off. And I think I managed to do it in 15 minutes more or less. Happy for questions, also happy to answer many of those questions over pits and beer. So who dares to ask a question? <laughs> hey, so you talked about the feedback mechanism in the model, which I personally believe is an excellent um, way for any model to learn um, over time. Um, I wonder how would you handle the problem of uh, getting contradictory feedback from, um, you know, different observers, let's say, around the same uh, prediction, would there be any, um, any checks around that? Yeah, very good question. Um, in the end, you're right, if you get wrong feedback signals, and you could also make the model worse. Um, the way it is handled right now is that we kind of agree on a test set beforehand, where the model performs on, and we would not push the model if kind of the accuracy on the new test set is worse but still um, the problem is, is, is there, yes. And you can obviously kind of install thousands of different checkpoints, et cetera. Um, and to be quite frank, we do not have thousands of checkpoints in place right now. Um, first of all, because we are a relatively small company. And um, I think through this mechanism where you kind of agree on the next test set, you at least have some kind of security um, that you would not push something that makes the model go uh, go banana. Yeah. <laughs> now the tough question is coming. <laughs> no, no, essentially it's repeating a question about again, let's assume the customer is happy, uh, has a very good visual inspection system, uh, you have your money, you are also happy. Uh, but then the management decides, for example, to change the light in the factory floors, and this requires a retraining of the model and a new adjustment. So what happens then? My question is more targeted in, do you also enable your clients to maintain and um, yeah, to maintain the model, basically, or the system? Yeah, good question. Uh, maybe a two-folded answer. Um, what we haven't shown here, but what is the case actually, when we meet our KPIs, the model KPIs, you buy the, um, the solution, but you buy a full service package. So we do the entire maintenance, and we also, so everything which is recalibration is included, and which is also included is uh, twice per year, per year completely not kind of recalibrating something, but also there might be a case, you have a production line 
and then a couple of months or years later you decide I want to produce something else or the parts that are produced uh, get a different knit or whatever something something additional on it so it's in the end it is a full service package but yes you are uh, addressing a really very relevant topic um, we haven't developed an algorithm yet that is um, that, that is perfect, that is perfectly ro robust. That's actually one of the research topics of, of, of one of our co-founders, but I think um, if we would have um, developed such a super robust model, um, then uh, maybe I could also show some different slides today. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But Peter, just maybe adding to that question, right? So assuming this works, right? It seems to be a no brainer, right? For a company, you can save working, uh, you know, save money on, on work, on manual workers, and then you have this AI system. What's the barriers? What's the kind of the cumberstones you still have, you know, when you talk to those manufacturing companies? Uh, it's, it's, it's various in the end. Um, I think it, it was a little bit of a joke, but it's also that people are conservative and they're used to certain certain things, how, how things are, are managed. Um, and then it's just, I think it's a lot, a lot is time actually. Um, so I think most of you in the room know B2B sales is rather a long-term game. It's not like you set up a website and then two days later you have 50 sales. It takes some time. Um, and obviously we are early, we are piloting this with different, with different clients, um, but to be 100% transparent, we are not a 10 year old company. Uh, we started last year in the summer, but that's also why we say, this is the approach we wanna do. We are very certain that it works and that's why we are willing to go into the risk. Um, but I think in the end, it's a, it's a matter of time because technology theoretically is there. We now need to, we need to apply it, yes. Once right. you have enough proof points, you can change the model again. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs> By the way, we are, if I'm allowed, I think um, sharing all the slides afterwards on our event page. So you, if you, know, you don't need to necessarily make photos, but you will have those um, presentations there. With that, Final slides, um, uh, and three, I think three words. So one is, um, there's another one, um, another AI Monday event coming up here in the region, which is on December 9th. Um, we're back in uh, the Porsche uh, um, Foundry, thanks so much. Um, there's also other AI Mondays, as I said in the beginning, uh, coming up this year still, uh, one in Leipzig and one in Berlin. Uh, Berlin will be on arts, so, um, Everybody, um, and it will be part of the Kraftwerk. There's a really, really fancy AI kind of uh, themed um, uh, exhibition. So uh, if you happen to be in Berlin, go there. Um, second, um, use um, this AI Monday hashtag for you know just uh, telling people in the social media space how you liked it. Uh, of course, only if you liked it, and then. And then third, um, I will be around, Daniel will be around. Give us feedback on what you would like to you know, do differently, what you liked as well. Uh, if you have any uh, specific speakers in mind that uh, you want to see here in one of the next events uh, of the next years, we have uh, some planned. Uh, also let us know and drop us an email on the website. And with that, thanks so much for coming. Um, stay, we have beers and, and pizza and, and drinks out there. Um, thanks for coming.